I want to let you in on a little bit of perspective here um, for me, because I don't know about you, but I, I look around so often and I see craziness going on and I see, uh, I mean, I'm the youth pastor here at Walnut Hill for anybody who doesn't know. And so seeing the things that our teenagers are having to deal with and wrestle through and things in my own life that I have to deal with and wrestle through and things that just don't make sense or I want to look at God and be like, what are you doing? Like, I just, I don't get it. Um, And so for me, there's a couple specific passages that just go such a long way in my heart and in my soul as I come before the Lord in those times. Um, One of the big ones that comes to mind is is Isaiah 55, where God's saying, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Um, And talks about how much higher his thoughts are than ours. Um, And there's a couple stories uh, in Scripture that, that really remind me of that as well. Uh, one of them being Jonah, um, one of the most powerful classes that I ever had in college um, was a minor prophets class, and my professor taught on Jonah, and every other class, we had one class kind of designated for each of the minor prophets, and this class in particular, we had to have all of our reading done ahead of time and all that kind of stuff, but this class in particular our professor took the entire time to teach us about how terrible Nineveh was. The whole time. Like, I mean, we had like five minutes left and we had barely opened the book of Jonah because my professor's uh, point was to say we would have done the same thing. We would have had those same feelings that Jonah had those same frustrations, those same um, struggles with the Lord as Jonah looked at, at God and said, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't want you to be gracious to these people. So we're going to look at Jonah's response to the Lord in a few minutes. But the, the text, the other text that comes to mind for me is the book of Job. I love the book of Job. Um, was putting this together just this morning. I think one of the reasons I love the book of Job so much is it was one of my dad's favorite books of the Bible. Um, He loved the wrestling with who God was and whether or not God had the authority um, to do the things that he did in Job's life. And so my wife laughed at me when she asked me what I was going to be speaking on this morning, and I told her Job. Um, she said, you do know it's the week before Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? Um, to which I laughed and said yes. Um, but I hadn't actually put that together at that point. This was pretty funny. So we're going to jump into Job's story here this morning. Um, so if you have your Bible with you and you want to open to the book of Job, that'd be great. I'm going to kind of take you through uh, quite a few different passages here. Um, but a good place to start is probably Job 1.1. 1, 1. Good a place as any. Thank you. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Does anybody else want to be described like that? I mean, that's, that's huge. Opening verse of this book. And it continues and explains more of why it's saying this, and then goes into this story of how um, people are coming, and, and, or angels are coming, giving count to God. And God kind of offers up Job to Satan and says, have you considered my servant Job? Right? Like, right off the bat, we've got this weird dynamic where the Lord's kind of lobbing Job up for Satan, right? Satan been wandering around the earth, pestering people. Um, And Job is kind of offered up. 
And then we see God allow Satan to torment Job, tells him not to touch his body, but he goes and he kills, has all of his livestock, all of his servants, and then finally all of his children are dead, are gone. Let that sink in for a second. The, the way the, the passage takes us through that is one servant would come and tell him about one, one group of cattle or one, um, some of his possessions that were destroyed and all the servants that were taking care of him. And while they were still speaking, three times this happens. The last one being telling them about his kids who died. And I want us to look at Job's response. He kind of gets after it, right? This is only 20 verses into the book of Job. And all of this has already happened. And this is Job's response. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I, come from, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Part of the reason that I love the story of Job, part of the reason that I go back to this book so often, is for this perspective. He lost everything. And yet this is his response. And I thought I was being all clever and like looked up in the Hebrew what worshipped was and what blessed was and worshipped meant worshipped. <laughs> this isn't some tricky English word that actually means that Job yelled at God. Like he actually came before the Lord and worshipped him as king. He actually came before the Lord and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Continues, Satan comes back to, to the Lord and, and God says, Yeah, you see that my, my servant didn't do anything wrong here. Um, actually, I want to read the next verse there too. It says, In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. That's verse 22. Okay, so in his response, he didn't sin. He didn't charge God with wrong. And then we see Satan come back and God kind of challenges him and and says again, well, Lord, you you didn't, Satan says to, to God, well, you didn't let me reach out your hand against his skin, his flesh, his bones. Let me do that. And then he'll curse you to your face. And so we see Satan being allowed to go and to torment Job and says that he had boils that covered his entire body. I don't even, I don't even have a clue what that would look like or feel like. But this is one of the things that I kind of gloss over. Like, I don't want to stay there too long. <laughs> it sounds horrible. Um, and we see this, this response, and, and, and there's an incredible moment where Job's wife even comes to him. And she says, to curse God and die. This is what she says. She said, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall I receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. One of the things that was really interesting as I was studying this this week, is that this term for curse, God and die, is the same exact word in Hebrew 
for blessed in chapter 1 when, when Job was, was actually coming and blessing God. And so here we see this is actually a sarcasm. It's a sarcastic use in the Hebrew of this term, which is the reason it gets translated as cursed. Curse God and die. And you can see You can see Job's wife's pain in this. They weren't only Job's kids. It wasn't only Job's stuff. It wasn't only his health, as we see in Scripture, that that what's ours in marriage, what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine, right? She had to deal with him with boils all over his body. <laughs> um, wives, anybody want to deal with their husband with boils? All that doesn't sound good. And so I think we can easily look at Job's wife's response and kind of condemn her. She's telling Job to curse God and die. Do we see Job condemn her? Does he call her a foolish woman? He doesn't. He says, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. And I think we see Job here coming alongside his grieving wife. in the midst of what she's going through, and he's, he's coming alongside her as well. There's a lot of teaching that goes on here, isn't there? Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Uh, again, I thought I was going to find some juicy tidbit for you of why it talks about him not sinning with his lips. Maybe, maybe he sinned with his heart. Maybe that's the meaning of this text, but I didn't find any of that. It's just saying that he, he acted rightly. He spoke rightly in this passage. But I think like many of us, even if we're able in, those, in some times to come before the Lord in a way that is honoring to him in a right response, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of sorrow, we see a challenge that Job ends up going through, right? So this is just the first two chapters of Job. He then continues by having three of his friends come and basically bring up this idea of, hey, Job, we know that God is just, You, you were really blessed. Now you're really not. So what'd you do? <laughs> right? We see this challenge that kind of makes sense. Doesn't it? This idea as we think about things in human logic, in human thought, this makes sense to me. If I do what's right, I should get reward. If I do what's wrong, if I mess up, I should have punishment, right? Like there's, there's this, this philosophy that's going on from all of Job's friends. And as this is happening, basically the, the structure of this, this poetry in Job is that one of his friends comes and brings him an, an argument or tries to help. They really, I think they really are trying to help him out. Um, they come to him and say, hey, you might have really messed up. And Job comes back and goes... No, you're, you're accusing me of something that I did not do. I have not turned my back on the Lord. I have not done these things. And so it's this series of conversations where one of the friends would talk and Job would respond, maintaining his integrity, maintaining that he was just and that he did not do what they were talking about. And it's interesting because if you think back to verse 1 of the, book, of the first chapter, 
we know that that's kind of true. Now, this isn't saying that Job was perfect. It's not what I'm communicating here. But we know that the reason for his suffering is not punishment for some thing that Job did. But we see Job start to really wrestle in these conversations. And these are a couple of his responses that I think, um, as I was studying and and reading through this, I think this is where Job does kind of enter sin here in his response. He has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. My adversary sharpens his eyes against me. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. Like we see this pain that Job has gone through and all of these discussions, all of these arguments with his friends. We see him start to actually get to this point where he's saying, God hates me. Guys, is that true? That's not true the reality of this. That's the opposite, (laughs) right, of of the character and nature of God. He continues, we see in 1911, he has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. Again, accusations about God's nature towards him. And Job gets really bold It's really bold. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Again, this adversary being the Lord. Surely I would carry it on my shoulders. I would bring it on me as a crown. I would give an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. I think just as we were amazed by the humility and the, um, the care of his response early in the chapter, I don't know about you, but I read this and I go, huh, uh, Job, you're playing with fire, man. Really? You'd give an account for all of your steps and approach like a prince, the God of the universe. This is the part of Job that for me as I look around and I think about the garbage that goes on in our world, the things that go on in our lives, the stuff that's hard that I don't understand, this is one of the passages, these last few chapters of Job, it's one, of the, one of the sections of Scripture that is so challenging to my soul. This is God's response. I'm sorry. I want to read some of God's response. This was too long for me to uh, put on slides. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Let that sink in for just a second. And said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I think it was at this point that Job soiled his pants. Okay? Um, I, <laughs> I just can't even imagine. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Sorry, I'm in chapter 38. Anybody who's trying to see where I'm at. Verse 5, who determined, sorry, I'm going to go back to verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garments 
and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. God's calling him out, right? Where were you? Who are you to question me? My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And the Lord, Lord said to Job, jumping over to chapter 40, verse 1, And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. I absolutely love Job's response. Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. I think this is a right posture before the God of the universe. Remember that part where Job wanted God to come and give an account? (laughs) He'll approach him like a prince. I think we see a right posture, a right response from Job here in chapter 40. But God's not done. (laughs) And I skipped over the rest of 38, all of 39, where God goes through a list of things. He names animals, asks Job if he can control all the things of the world. Right? He goes through all kinds of things. I encourage you to read it. And then he continues in, 40, in chapter 40, verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowing of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. God puts Job in his place. (laughs) Notice that there's not a single reference to, hey Job, I'm really sorry. It was Satan. I didn't even do it. Did you notice that? Not once in this entire book does God point back to Satan to give an account to Job? And there are multiple times throughout this book that God is credited with the calamity often used as evil or disaster that comes to him. Job then responds again in 42 after God goes through a description of of two mythical, possibly mythical creatures, this big, long, poetic description of these these creatures, um, which is a whole sermon in and of itself. Um, So we're going to skip it for now. But this is his response. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Notice that he's going to then quote the Lord. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Who was God talking about? 
Job. Okay, so he's reiterating, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Again, he's quoting the Lord, saying this to him. Job's response, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Guys, I think that we way too often think that we have a right think that we have a leg to stand on and being angry at God in the midst of things that go in a way that is not how we would want them to go. I think the reason that this passage, the reason that this book is such a challenge and an encouragement to me is it gives me perspective. This book doesn't go through Tell us all the stuff that happens to Job and then give a reason for his suffering. Not once in God's answer does he say, Hey, Job, I was testing you. All he does is challenge Job's authority and position to even ask the question. We see Job used as an example in James 5. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Isn't it interesting how James describes the Lord after he talks about Job? My first thought about the Lord's interaction and the Lord's action, I guess, in the book of Job is not compassion and mercy. I think of sorrow. <laughs> I think of hardship. And yet we see Job pointed out in James as this, and I want to take a second and look at this idea of steadfastness. Um, and as we, as we look at a couple other things here, I want to pose a question that I think is um, central to the book of Job. Is he more precious than your possessions, family, and health? Isn't that the question? I mean, when, when Satan comes before God in the first chapter of Job, his reason that he gives to God for Job being an upright man who fears the Lord is because God gives him a bunch of stuff. He says, you give him, you give him all your blessings. Why wouldn't he love you? Why wouldn't he adore you? He's wealthy. He's got all the things that he wants. When that doesn't work, Satan comes back and he says, yeah, but you have a hedge of protection. Strike his bones and his flesh, and then he'll curse you to your face. Guys, is he more precious to us than our stuff, than our family, than our health? One of the things that's mentioned or one of the things we need to be thinking about here is God's glory. Because as we, as we think through the book of Job, as we see God come before Job and really um, question him, we see his response to the way that Job has questioned God. And I think so much of God's, so much of the gift that we have when we think about his compassion and his mercy is his glory. And I want to look at a couple different 
passages here that, that talk about the Lord. In Psalm 63, 1 to 2, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Don't you think it's some of God's power and glory in that whirlwind as Job was being questioned that, that changed his tune? He was no longer coming before God as a prince, wearing, wearing the accusation as a crown on his head. Because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Guys, I think this idea of it being better than life. Okay? His steadfast love being better than life. Don't we see from Job? The answer to that question, his steadfast love is better than his stuff. His steadfast love is better than his family. His steadfast love is better than his health. I think that's a lot of the example that we see. This glory being shown, I, I thought through so many different examples, and one of them that is just incredible to me in Isaiah 6, 4-5, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Guys, this is another response of seeing God's glory We've got Job saying, I put my hand on my mouth, I will not reply again. We've got him getting to a point of seeing God's glory and realizing his glory compared to Job's is that Job would despise himself because of how much more glorious God is. There's several others. Moses, as he sees, I I love this passage because it's like a, Surprise, this is God. As Moses gets all curious when he sees the burning bush, he like walks over there. I'd be freaking out when I saw a burning bush that wasn't being devoured. For some reason, Moses is just curious. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Moses saw on a daily basis, but kind of crazy. Um, and then out of the bush, God speaks and tells him to take off his shoes for he's on holy ground. And then you see the fear. The Oh my goodness, this is someone who's got a whole lot more power and authority and glory than I do. Jonah, Jonah is a little different. I mentioned Jonah earlier and I I absolutely love um, the way that Jonah replies and the the example that we see um, as I missed my, or lost my, there we go. I love his response in Jonah 4. I mean, how bold of Jonah here. But but it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God was gracious and saved the people of Nineveh. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? <clears throat> that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's like yelling that at God. Like, God, I know you're awesome. I know you're amazing. I know you're loving. As Jonah throws his little temper tantrum, And yet God is gracious in the midst of him wrestling with the Lord. I love that Jonah ends um, (laughs) with, with us not really knowing if Jonah gets to the same place that Job does. We don't see Jonah get to a place of saying, 
Lord, your ways are higher than my ways. I don't get it, but you are God. You are sovereign. It ends with God telling Jonah how many people are in Nineveh and should I, should I not want to save this city? And then this is the last verse of Jonah. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, this is the best, and also much cattle. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's hilarious. I love the way that God responds the glory that he shows, the right response that we see, and some kind of temper tantrum responses that we see. The transfiguration, the disciples that Jesus has with him, it says they fall to their faces in terror because of the glory that they saw. Saul falls to the ground in fear when God meets him on the road to Damascus. One of the questions, as I was talking in staff meeting a little bit about what I was going to be preaching about, one of, the, one of the questions was this idea of what's the connection to us? Um, in a lot of ways, we don't, we don't see God show up in a whirlwind. Um, I really do think most of us would soil our pants. Um, but guys, we've been given God's glory in the incarnation of Christ. We've been shown his glory through Jesus in a way that is so much more direct than Job saw it. We have an account in Scripture that is so clear and so full, and I want to Kind of wrap up with this passage in 2 Corinthians. Um, If you want to turn there, this is kind of where we'll we'll end. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Been reading a a book called God is the Gospel by John Piper. Um, It's an incredible read if you like reading. I really think I have ADD, so I buy it on audiobook and have headphones on, and I have the book. So I'm like listening to it and reading it and underline. It's awesome. Um, But one of the things that, that Piper talks about is the fact that this passage is one of the central passages to what the gospel is. I want to go there for a few minutes. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or or to tamper with God's word. I want to sit there for a minute. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Guys, remember that God didn't try to justify what happened to Job. He didn't blame Satan. He didn't give Job all kinds of reasons. He simply said, I'm God. You are not. That's it. And I think so often we we do get wrapped up wanting to wanting to try to make the gospel more appealing, which in its statement is insane. Um, We don't need to be cunning. We don't need to be crafty in how we present the gospel. We need to present the gospel of truth to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. This is where Piper picks up. In their case, the God of this world, so Satan, 
has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel for the glory of Christ, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Guys, we are given Jesus. We are given God incarnate as our example, as our display of his glory. And then we've had the Holy Spirit placed in our hearts. Guys, we have just as much opportunity to come before the Lord the way Job did and acknowledge God's sovereignty over all things and to love him because of his steadfast love. So I want to leave you with this question. Is he more precious than your possessions, your family, your health? I added these ones for us in America for our safety, for our security, for our life? Is he more precious? Is God our ultimate aim, relationship with him? Or do we just want his stuff? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the example that we see in Job. Thank you for the opportunity to see your steadfast love, your compassion and your mercy as you come and you show us your glory and we are alive long enough to respond to it. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you go. Um, Go ahead and greet one another this morning. And thank you all for being here.